to talk a lot about cities today, about citiesmatter.ca, and about the need for the provincial parties to really be addressing these issues that are important to Calgarians and to Albertans that live in other cities across the province. As you know, we have surveyed extensively all of the uh, five political parties in this election, and we have talked to them about 10 major issues. Those range from infrastructure, to financing, to authority and governance, um, uh, to things like the Southwest Ring Road. And all Albertans can view all of those results verbatim in their entirety at citiesmatter.ca. But I also thought it would be helpful to share some analysis of what we learned. And let me start by talking about why cities matter in this election. It may seem a bit weird for the mayor of a city to be talking about issues of, that are provincial responsibility during an election. But the fact is that cities do matter in this provincial election because every city in this province, indeed most cities across the country, are facing the same problem. And that problem is that we have an antiquated system, an antiquated system of authority and an antiquated system of financing for cities. We have to provide the services every single day that keep people happy, that keep people healthy, that keep people safe, that keep people alive, and yet we are the order of government that has the least ability to actually provide those services. And it is time for us to have that discussion with our provincial politicians. Now I've been warned many, 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 many times before today that I'm not to be a pundit. You all know what my old job was. Um, but I am going to put my pundit hat on for a second. And I'm going to say that the other reason that cities matter in this election is because whoever wins Calgary is going to win the election. The city of Calgary is the entire ball of wax in this election in a way that it probably has not been in previous elections in my memory. And we've got 25 seats. Uh, and whoever can figure out what the people of Calgary need from their provincial government is going to win this election. And that's the other reason why this is incredibly important for the parties to be able to share this information with us at this time. Let me start with good news. I've been following provincial politics for a long time. I know I have weird hobbies. But I cannot remember a time in provincial politics where municipal issues have been at the forefront of the discussion the way they are now. And I think that is incredibly good. I think that all five parties clearly understand that the system we have now is broken, particularly for Calgary and Edmonton, but for all municipalities across the province. And I'm pleased that every single party acknowledges that there really is a need for change. Now, there are 10 issues uh, in the Cities Matter survey. I'm going to highlight just three of them and talk about the, each party's response on those three. And those three are a new relationship, a new legislative and governance authority between the cities and the province, the issue of money, everyone's favorite topic, and um, the issue of regional planning. And I'll take you through a little bit of analysis on each of these. The video of today's press conference will also be posted at citiesmatter.ca, uh, or it'll be posted on the web in any case. Uh, and we will have some more analysis, some more written analysis, and a few tools to help people uh, go through the responses that are up there already. So let's talk about a new relationship. When the uh, Constitution was promulgated in 1867, Canada was largely an agrarian society, a rural society. Now we are one of the most urbanized societies in the world. And Alberta is one of the leaders in that urbanization. Yet we've got a municipal government act that hasn't been updated since 1991 and that it's based on 19th century legislation and a 19th century concept of municipal government. We've evolved, and we need change in that. Uh, you know, there are many, many examples of that. Um, I've gone through many of them before. I don't need to go into any of them in detail, but my favorite, favorite one was the famous $15 fee that the province added to all traffic tickets, but didn't give the cities the ability to actually raise the price of the traffic ticket. So we had to find the $15 within our existing police budgets didn't make any sense. And it's just one example of things that we deal with every single day. So, on the new relationship, this is interesting. All five political parties talk about the need for a new relationship. Four out of five specifically talk about the need for city charters in Calgary and Edmonton. The fifth one doesn't use the word charters, that's the Wild Rose Party, but they certainly talk about the need for an entirely new relationship and to recognize cities as an order of government. 
Now, I would have preferred if they had thrown in the word equal order of government, but certainly uh, this is a conversation that is ripe. I don't think you would have seen this anywhere uh, several years ago. I'm quite pleased about it. And going through each of them relatively quickly. The Alberta Party, um, unsurprisingly, has a pretty sophisticated view of municipal issues. And the reason I say unsurprisingly is because, of course, the leader of the Alberta Party uh, was until recently the mayor of a city and understands these issues, I think, quite deeply. But they recognize cities as an order of government. They will consider a charter for Calgary and Edmonton. The New Democrats are looking at rewriting the Municipal Government Act and addressing infrastructure needs. Interestingly, they said we need to outline what those infrastructure needs are. Good news to the New Democrats, we've done that already. Uh, and I know, I know the city of Edmonton has as well, so we know what those needs are. And they too will consider a charter. Wild Rose will recognize cities as an order of government. They're open to unique status for Calgary and Edmonton. Um, and they will legislate responsibilities and roles in regional land use planning about which more later. Um, I want to highlight this, which is, I don't think that the city of Calgary is particularly uh, in love with that word charter. The form is not important. What is important is the content of the legislation, and all five parties have highlighted that. The Liberals will enact city charters. They feel they are the best legislative tool for Calgary and Edmonton. They want to establish broad and permissive powers. They're probably the most assertive of the five in the need to grant new powers to municipalities. Uh, the Progressive Conservatives recognize that the MGA is outdated. Thank you. They support the inclusion of city charters as part of the consideration. They were a bit weaker on the language than some of the other parties, but there was a commitment to start that work immediately after the election. And they were, in fact, the only party to commit to anything that looked like a timeline. Uh, and I think that that is particularly important. So I do say to all of the other parties that if you are elected, this needs to be a major priority and work on it needs to happen right away. It needs to start happening right away. Let's talk about money. Cities need predictable and stable forms of funding to succeed. Property tax alone does not cover the growing needs of cities. As we all know, cities rely fundamentally on only three sources of revenue. Property taxes, user fees, transfers from other orders of government. So when you think about the property taxes that the city of Calgary um, collects each year, it's about $1.3 billion a year on a budget of about $3 billion. The cost of the Southeast LRT alone is somewhere between two and a half and $3 billion, or our entire operating budget per year. It's impossible to imagine that the city could build the Southeast LRT only with the property tax base. We need to figure out better ways of doing that. The current government has provided two major funding programs for infrastructure, Green Trip and MSI. They're good programs. We put the money to good use. Calgarians are benefiting every day uh, from the investments in those programs, but they both end in 2018. And so we need to understand what happens after that. And in particular, the envelope of money for transit, Green Trip, $800 million um, to the city of Calgary over a very long period of time, not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. Transit infrastructure is very expensive, and we need much, much broader commitments to transit if we want to actually build these things. That's why we need a real solution. So what I want to do now is go through each party and tell you what their platform looks like in our analysis. And I will also do so by going through the lens of the Southeast LRT. Under each party's platform, would the Southeast LRT get built? So let's start with the Alberta Party. The Alberta Party suggests that there will be a gradual shift to the education property tax. In other words, the province will stop collecting the education property tax and turn that money over to cities. This is the most stable source of revenue for us and it will bring a lot of revenue into the city's control. The problem is it makes the city even more reliant on property taxes. Property taxes, as I've said many times, are a terrible, terrible form of taxation. So that's the trade-off there. Uh, the New Democrats also support transferring the entire education property tax to the control of the cities. This will bring us about $630 million annually. The New Democrats further say that they will increase royalty rates and they will earmark that increase towards infrastructure and fulfill the green trip in the MSI. So the Alberta Party and New Democrat Party um, offers are similar. Would it get the Southeast LRT built? And the answer is probably not. Um, if that money from the education property tax is brand new money and no other transfers are cut, we could use that money for projects like that. If, however, they use that opportunity to take back other grant money, um, then we probably wouldn't be able to do that without cutting other infrastructure investments. The Wild Rose Plan. 
the famous 10-10 plan would earmark 10% of taxes and 10% of surpluses uh, to the city. They have also suggested that throughout the transition, they would honor existing commitments under Green Trip and MSI. We have crunched a lot of numbers on this one. Um, and in fact, I had the opportunity, as you know, I've been speaking with the various party leaders, and I had the opportunity to spend some serious time with Ms. Smith today uh, talking about these numbers uh, and what they might look like. And the answer is we don't really know. It depends on the design of the program. But if we take some very uh, generous assumptions for what that looks like, it means for the next few years, the city would be about, the city of Calgary would be a wash, roughly. The money that would be proposed to us under the 10-10 plan would be about what is proposed to us currently under the various um, provincial government funding plans. Uh, there are some small numbers that were based on assumptions, but it's pretty much a wash. Um, if, in fact, the province goes into surplus starting in 2014, however, that means considerably more money for the City of Calgary than under the current system, especially after Green Trip and MSI expire. Uh, considerably more money. There, is, uh, there are a number of details that need to be ironed out in the 1010 plan. How would we allocate that amongst different municipalities, amongst big cities and rural areas and so on? I don't know that anyone has the answers. And I will point out, if I can be so bold, there is also an error in the 1010 plan. Uh, and that error is that we would also share gas taxes on a 1010 basis, but of course municipalities get way more than that now. So they really need to think hard about whether they actually meant to include that one or not because it changes the numbers quite quickly. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they didn't mean uh, to have that one in there. So would the Southeast LRT get built under the Wild Rose Plan? Yes, but it would be much later. Uh, the money wouldn't start flowing until closer to the end of this decade uh, in a way that we could actually build the Southeast LRT. Again, this one is based strongly on assumptions um, about surplus, about revenue. Uh, it is not predictable and it is not stable. Uh, which are the criteria that we are looking for. But it is money. So that is uh, where we are looking at. So I'm encouraged by this plan. I'm really encouraged by giving cities access to more than the eight cents of taxes that we currently get, eight cents of every dollar you pay. But we have a lot of assumptions in there that need to get ironed out. Um, that takes us to the, uh, where did it go? It would take us to the Alberta Liberal Plan if I could find it, there we are. Um, and uh, so again, lots of questions about the Wild Rose Plan, but it's very interesting. Um, the Liberal Plan, uh, they talk very explicitly about expanded financial tools, uh, including things that have been in the press before, like the optional penny tax on the GST. Uh, they will remove the debt ceiling on municipalities, which is maybe dangerous for other organizations, but certainly uh, in a place that has really sophisticated um, debt analysis and risk analysis like the City of Calgary. Uh, could be interesting. We have no interest in increasing our debt uh, beyond short-term borrowings, but it is an interesting idea. And of course, their big plan is the Municipal Heritage Fund. Uh, the Municipal Heritage Fund is based on market return. So it's about not touching the principal, but using the interest to fund infrastructure. 75% um, to municipalities and 25% to neighborhood associations. It's not clear what that means. I understand Mr. Sherman uh, was making an announcement on that today, and hopefully there'll be a little more clarity in all of that. Um, they also talk about a carbon levy on real emissions that would go towards Calgary um, annually, and they talk about considering changes to the education property tax. This one's hard to parse. It's quite difficult to figure out how much money we would get every year uh, out of this, uh, particularly based on the return, the market return on the Heritage Fund. Uh, it's like trying to figure out exactly what you're going to make on your stock market portfolio. So would we be able to build the Southeast LRT under the Liberal Plan? Maybe. Um, and it really does depend on those numbers around market return. Progressive Conservative Party. Um, their response on this was a long list of things that they've already done uh, and a commitment to extend the time on the MSI um, to 2023 at a minimum $1.6 billion per year growing as appropriate. It's not clear how that would be allocated among, other, um, among the various municipalities. It could be up to $2.5 billion beyond what we received in 2018. Uh, they seem to want greater oversight of the spending, which is a bit weird. Um, you know, they seem to want cities to abide to a different standard, a higher standard than the province itself abides to. But of course, municipalities already adhere to a much higher standard of disclosure on the money that we spend um, than other orders of government do. 
would the PC plan get us the Southeast LRT? Probably not. Um, unless the government showed up with special one-time funding in order to build high priority infrastructure projects, which has been their pattern in the past. Um, certainly showing up with a check when there is money available. So it is difficult to figure out how that might work. We might be able to use that additional MSI money to that, but remember that the City of Calgary has well over $10 billion in unfunded infrastructure needs um, and supporting only on one provincial government program, which at the whim of the provincial government makes it extremely challenging to plan in the future. So three out of five parties, therefore, support giving municipalities the education portion of the property tax. One adds additional financial supports, um, and one of them uh, kind of blows up the system and looks at a whole new and different way of revenue sharing. And the other one, of course, extends current grant programs quite far into the future. Good news, there's more money for infrastructure that people need in all five plans. The question is, is it enough for extremely uh, expensive pieces of infrastructure like LRT? Final issue I want to talk about before we go to questions today is regional planning. This is an issue that causes a lot of people's eyes to glaze over. It's not an issue that's always in the headlines every single day, but it is incredibly important uh, for us to be able to understand how we're going to plan together as a region going forward. Uncoordinated growth leads to wasted resources, wasted tax dollars, and poorer services to citizens. We need regional collaboration, thoughtful planning. We need to share our water. And we need to think about ways to develop intercommunity transit. Regional planning is incredibly important. Unfortunately, all five of the parties, uh, in different measure, don't seem to really get this one, um, or really understand the importance of good regional planning to the city of Calgary. Um, the Alberta party is probably the best of the bunch on this one. Um, the Alberta party is against bills 36 and 19. They want new legislation that focuses on communities and stakeholders. They do support the Calgary Metropolitan Plan, and they would legislate that plan after further consultation with CRP members. The problem is it's Bill 36 that gives them the ability to legislate that plan. So if they repeal it, it might be hard for them to legislate it. So I think that they need to be a little more thoughtful on uh, what's going on here, which is a standard theme through the other, uh, through the other ones as well. The NDP respects consensus among regional stakeholders, insists on targets for environmental planning. I'm not sure they understand deeply the complexity of the regional planning issue here in Calgary. Wild Rose will, as with the Alberta Party, repeal Bills 36 and 19. They will establish regional planning commissions. They'll leave detailed planning and regulation to local governments to be affected through local and sub-regional plans and land use bylaws. This one is very interesting. Because essentially what they're saying is start all over again. Start from scratch, abandon the last five or seven years of work um, on regional planning, and start a new process. The funny thing is the new process they're outlining is exactly the same as the process we've gone through over the last five years, um, with slightly different names. I'm not sure they understand the complexity of this issue and what it means to the city of Calgary, and I think that it's important for them to, uh, to get it. Um, uh, they just need to get it. Uh, liberals, similarly, pretty vague. They're encouraged by the Calgary Metropolitan Plan, so are we, um, but they don't really mention where they're gonna go with it. Progressive conservatives on this file, well, let's just say it's difficult to get a straight answer. Um, when we look in the survey, they say that they support regional planning, they'll work with municipalities to ensure that regional plans are settled after meaningful discussion between all sides. They hint at brokering a solution, at getting more involved uh, in the regional planning process, certainly not something they've done over the last 18 months despite repeated requests uh, since I've been in this job. But then something weird happened last night, which is that last night in the debate in Highwood, their local candidate gave a very different response on the Calgary uh, Regional Partnership and the Calgary Metropolitan Plan uh, than we have heard in their survey results. And it echoed a response that the Premier made in a speech just before the writ was dropped, uh, where they used terms like the Calgary veto, said that the plan was a bad plan, and that they would not uh, actually implement it. It's very challenging. Very, very challenging. And it's important that we receive a, a real answer from the PCs, and I look forward to getting that. And if we get it, we will post their clarification on this matter uh, when, we, when it is provided. The point is that good collaborative planning matters. 14 municipalities across the, 
uh, Calgary region have come together voluntarily. We've come up with a solution, a grassroots solution that reflects all of our needs. It's been incredibly hard. The biggest surprise in my job probably has been the amount of time that we've been spending on this issue. Um, and the next Premier will find a region that is ready to be thoughtful and to move forward on this. And we hope that they will be equally ready. So finally, citiesmatter.ca is about getting our provincial politicians accountable. It's about asking them where they stand on important issues. It's about providing clarity and answers to citizens. I hope that Calgarians and Albertans find this informative and that they find it helpful, and I hope it's the starting point for a very, very good discussion. As we get closer to the leaders' debates, I hope that the party leaders will explain even more about this. The door is certainly open to all party leaders to further clarify their point of view on these issues and the merits of their plans. You know what? It's up to citizens now. It's up to every single Albertan. So I say to all Albertans, vote. Please vote. But before you vote, visit citiesmatter.ca, talk to your candidates, talk to your neighbours, and make an informed decision. Thank you all for your time and ready for questions. Can you yes. tell us who overall offers the best deal to the city and why? Well, uh, as I said, I think you have to go into the details um, to understand that. I think it's difficult to assign an overall grade to everyone. Every party has really good ideas. Some parties have uh, ideas that need a little more clarification and a little more clarity. But I'm mostly happy that every one of them is talking about cities. And can we ask you this? If you had your druthers, what would you like to get from the new government? Well, as I say, there are two big issues that we really have to solve. The first is around powers and authorities. Again, that sounds a bit dull, but it has incredible impact on people and the services they achieve that they receive every single day. And the second is we have to have a long-term financing solution. Every dollar that Calgarians spend in taxes, eight cents stays in the municipality. 92 cents goes to the provincial and federal government. Calgary taxpayers pay about $4 billion a year more to the province than we receive back in all provincial services. That's a real fiscal imbalance. So I'm not talking about new taxes. What I am talking about is a more fair sharing so that the level of government that has to provide all these services has the money in order to do it. And that's really the things I'm looking at. And that third thing feels like a sideshow thing, but we really need an answer on regional planning. This, uh, this file has been uh, adrift for much too long, and the parties uh, need to really focus in on this. Whoever's elected, this is going to become a major issue on their desk. You've talked a lot uh, since being elected, in fact, before being elected, on uh, revenue-generating uh, tools for, uh, for, for cities. Where do you see the province's plans on those? Well, I think that's sort of a misconception, actually. Um, I've talked a lot about revenue for cities. Um, a lot of people keep asking me about revenue-generating tools. Um, but what we're really talking about is reducing the proportion, or excuse me, reducing the reliance on the property tax. Right now, that's all we've got, property tax and user fees. And what we need to do is have stable, predictable forms of funding that get us away from the reliance on that pretty awful form of taxation. So that's really what this is about as far as I'm concerned. It's so that we can say with some certainty, we can borrow the money today to build that Southeast LRT because we know what our cash flows are going to be over the next 10, 15, or 20 years to pay off the mortgage we took out to build that LRT. We can't do that now. Our capital spending is dependent on the whims of the provincial government and who wants to show up with a big check and when they show up with the big check. Uh, and that's really what I'm looking for. So I'm incredibly agnostic on what that looks like. Um, but what I need is the what I need, what the people of Calgary need, is the predictability and the stability. Can you borrow against an income tax sharing uh, plan? Yeah, um, probably. Uh, that's actually an excellent technical question. Uh, the chal one of the challenges with the Wild Rose 1010 plan, again, it's all about details that need to be ironed out. But one of the challenges is that half of it, the provincial income tax, is relatively stable over time. It's not hugely stable, but we can kind of make good guesses about where it's going to be. The other half of it, which is about surpluses, is not predictable at all. So on that one, unfortunately, it would be another situation where, you know, on April 1st, we'd be waiting for our, uh, for our spring present to see if we've got any money to build stuff that year. Uh, and that's very challenging. So uh, part of it offers a degree of predictability and a degree of stability. The other one is very, very difficult to predict. But I thought I heard you say that under the wild under the PC plan, South Lake wouldn't get built. Under the Wild Rose plan, it would sometime in the future. As long as there's surpluses. So as long as there's surpluses. Yeah, so is delayed better than no plan? And therefore well, 
I should say that under what is in the current PC plan, it would be difficult to find the money to build it. But remember that the way that this has worked in the past is when there is surplus money, or when there is extra money, oftentimes the government of the day will think about spending it on infrastructure. And so we'll get a surprise announcement. You know, let's build this now. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying it would never get built. I am saying that under their current plan, the cash flows aren't there to build it without additional funding. But the wild roses will sometimes. As long as there's surpluses. As long as there's surpluses. Were you surprised by the quality of the responses of the incumbent government since they're the incumbents? And they've been handling the city's files for, or the city files, for 41 years. That they have a little bit of an advantage over opposition parties who have never been in power, and therefore, you would think. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that, um, because all of the parties have smart people yeah. um, who can look at the numbers as well as we can, right. and try and determine um, what is going on. It's tough when you're an incumbent government. I'm going to give them benefit of the doubt, because you have a record you have to defend. Um, I would have uh, preferred a little less record defending and a little more what we're going to do um, in the uh, PC response, um, but I understand where they're coming from. Uh, I was quite surprised about the PC response on regional planning, um, because that is a file that has been very, very close to successive um, ministers and successive premiers now, um, and I would have expected uh, a much more detailed answer on that. When I attended the PC leaders news conference this morning, a question on this issue was, was brought up in advance of this news conference. And the one response that somewhat took me back in light of what you said was that there will not, the PCs are not interested in, in additional rights of, of taxation. You would not be able to create new taxes. Is that what you're asking for? Well, no, I'm not really asking for new taxes, uh, as, I as I said in response to the earlier question. It's about better sharing of taxes. So I'm not particularly taken aback by them saying that, because we haven't asked for that. However, the fact that they would choose to highlight that, as opposed to how are we going to share revenue with the cities going forward, certainly causes me a little bit of grief. Uh, and I'd like some clarification on how they think then, therefore, that will come to a more equitable revenue sharing agreement. Do you think that, I mean, do the PCs offer you anything, anything that would get the uh, South Authority uh, built sooner other than this magical uh, possible one-time grant? No, and they didn't offer the magical possible one-time grant either. Uh, realistically, how long would it take under the under any of these plans to get the, wild, to get, to get the South Authority built? Because, I mean, the current plan, I think, was like late 20s. It depends on debt. Um, it really does depend on debt. Uh, as you know, we're going through a major process right now. I use the Southeast LRT as an example because I think it's easy for us to get our heads around it. But we're going through a major process right now at Calgary Transit called Road Ahead, where we're actually developing our capital plan for the next 20 years or so, and that'll be done by the end of the year, uh, next 30 years or so. I don't prioritize the different legs of the LRT, different capital investments, so I, I do want to highlight that. It might be the North Central LRT, but we're using the Southeast LRT as an example here. Um, and so under the various plans, the real question for the city is, do we wait until we've got two and a half or three billion dollars in our pocket in order to build it, or do we borrow money to build it more quickly, knowing that we've got cash flows coming in in order to pay that back? And so that really is a decision for the city council of the day. But what we really need to do is figure out, is the money ever going to come in anyway? It, it sounds, Your Worship, that none of the plans really set you on fire. Would that be fair to say they're, they're all kind of mediocre? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they're not all mediocre. They're not all mediocre. They're all actually pretty good. Um, because they could have just said, go away, you're not our responsibility. Um, or we've got other things to deal with. Healthcare and education are much bigger files for us. And none of them said that. And every one of them, I think, came to the table with pretty thoughtful policy prescriptions. I must say that. Um, and they're really interested in solving this problem. So I'm actually very, very, very happy about that. Um, if I could actually create the perfect platform and take a little bit from all five, you know, it would probably look different than any of the five that are here now. But I think every one of them gives us something we can work on with the new premier, whoever he or she may be. So none of the five, uh, at least in their responses, really is getting close to what the idea of the government? They're all moving us much closer much closer. Um, you know, just the simple fact, if you imagine four years ago, 
if the mayor of Calgary were standing here and he were saying, we need a new legislative framework in a city charter, I'm not sure that you would have had five parties going, yeah, you're right. Let's figure out what that looks like. Uh, so I think that they've all moved significantly into understanding the importance of cities. None of them are perfect. Um, but certainly they each give us a basis to work on. Look, what I know is that on the 24th of April, I'm going to have a lot of work to do. And this city council is going to have a lot of work to do, and the people of Calgary are going to have a lot of work to do. Because regardless of who is elected, every one of these parties is telling us we got to change the system. And it's really up to us as Calgarians to direct that change. What These guys have set out a direction, but we got to push it further. What party gives you the least in terms of financing and promises? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, it's very, that's actually very, very difficult to answer. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to uh, crunch some more numbers and put some spreadsheets up so people can see the difference in annual cash flow. And the reason it's hard to answer is because they put it in different places. So if, for example, um, the Liberals or the NDP or the Alberta Party vacate the entire education property tax, well, that's $600 million a year to Calgary. That's a lot of money. You know, that is essentially doubling what we get in provincial grants now. But what we don't know is then what happens. Do they take away the MSI and the policing grant um, and the things that they give us now? Um, is that a replacement or is it an addition? We just don't know the answer to that. Um, similarly, um, with the Conservatives, they have suggested an extension to MSI, but they have not suggested um, what proportion of that goes to Calgary or how it'll flow out over the years. So I, I wish I could answer that question because that is the golden question, but it's a little bit hard given the way the numbers have been proposed now. MSI right, folks, can we just do one more question sure. and then we'll go? MSI was uh, was supposed to be $1.4 billion over, like per year by now, and it's been $1 billion. So that ha that funding promise hasn't come through. The Green Trip funding promise hasn't come through. How, you know, and there's a lot of question from the, about how do you think the Wild Rose keep these promises? Because okay. it sounds like the most lofty promise for you. So do you actually trust that? So the issue, will never throw no, it's an excellent question. The issue is predictability and stability, as I said before, right? And really understanding what's happening. And what we really need to know is that when you defer things, as the previous government had done with the MSI over long periods of time, there's actually real concrete cost to the taxpayer in doing that. So the city of Calgary's already built a <coughs> OIT, so we're borrowing against future MSI funds. In fact, every penny of the MSI is now spoken for. Um, and when you delay that funding, then we have, we've already borrowed the money. So it means that hundreds of millions of dollars potentially could go just to the bank in interest payments. Uh, so it's important to understand that deferrals of spending when we're this far along actually cost a lot of money um, to the taxpayers and probably as much as you're going to save. So that is a really core point. And the biggest challenge that we have with current systems is when we rely on the provincial government writing us a check, whether it's a 10-year program or a one-time check, we got to rely on them and I got to rely on being able to go to the bank and cash the check. And that's why the system doesn't work. It means that the mayors of Calgary and Edmonton and other municipalities are reduced to going cap in hand and saying, please, sir, can I have some more um, every single time? And even sometimes when we're promised more, it doesn't actually come. You know, the Green Trip funding, we received a commitment for $473 million. We need it. That is going to buy new cars so that the people who get on the train at Shaughnessy at 7.20 in the morning can actually get a seat so that we actually have four car C trains. We need that very, very badly. But when the letter came saying, we're granting you $473 million, I looked in the envelope, I shook it, I tried to find it, but no check came out. And we have no idea when that money is actually going to come. And that's why we need predictability and stability going forward. Okay, all thanks right. all.